Well, thank you all for coming. I know that it's difficult to be inside learning on a Sunday afternoon when it's so nice and warm out, but I appreciate you coming to learn. Today, um, to get started on the GitHub repo that is listed there, if you'd like, there is a copy of the slides and also an IPython notebook that covers uh, what we'll go over today um, on getting started with HDF5. To begin, I want to get you thinking about whether or not you're a Pientist. So a Pientist is a Python programming scientist. I am a Pientist. Um, even if you're not a Pientist, maybe you're drowning in text files. Um, that happens to a lot of people dealing with data. Um, and if you have lots of text files, you may find yourself frequently grepping in order to find a particular text file that you're interested in. Or you might be extending file names for every processing step in your data analysis routine, um, which makes grepping all that more fun. Or you're just looking for something that um, is accessible, compressed, and organized for your data. So these are all really good reasons to use HDF5. They're all the reasons that I use HDF5. How many people in here have used HDF5 before? Quite a few of you. I will let you know that I'm going to go through H5Pi from a very beginner and novice standpoint, um, so hopefully it can bring a lot of other people up to speed, but I'm happy to, um, to discuss more advanced topics um, afterwards. Who am I? Well, first and foremost, I am a computational neuroscientist. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, which we have redefined as the North. Um, where I go to school at the University of Minnesota and I'm working on my PhD in biomedical informatics and computational biology, aka BICB. Recently, I left a position at the Brain Science Center, which is located at the Minneapolis VA, and um, where my research was focused on studying the brain network in healthy humans. I have recently been offered a new post in an exciting lab, uh, Dr. Samadani's Brain Injury and Research Lab, which is at another local hospital in Minneapolis, um, where I will be continuing my work studying brain networks in patients with brain trauma. And that would be people with TBI and, and or concussions. Um, that said, as a computational neuroscientist, I deal with a lot of data and lots of different kinds of data. So one of the instruments we use is magnetoencephalography, or MEG, um, and this provides high temporal resolution brain function, information about brain function. Uh, from this instrument, we acquire time series that are on the order of tens of hundreds of time points, and then um, for a given, uh, for the instrument that we were using, there are 248 sensors. So this would be for one scan. Um, so if we have one, one subject in a session, we have quite a bit of raw data that we're dealing with and, and different kinds of raw data that we have. And then naturally, we also want to process this data, so we would have um, various levels of pre-processing and then analysis of, of um, this data as well. So the number of files for a given subject is pretty high, and this becomes unmanageable when you're dealing with a couple thousand patients. So for us at the Brain Sciences Center, HDF5 presented as the most optimal solution. And uh, we also had rewritten our uh, processing pipeline from MATLAB to Python. And it was nice to know that HDF5 interfaced very well with Python as well. So what is HDF5? Well, HDF um, stands for Hierarchical Data Format. And this format is a, well, this HDF5 is a data model, library, and file format for storing and managing your data. And it can be basically described as a file system within a file. And it's designed for flexible and efficient storage and I.O. and high, for high volume and complex data. So if you're a person in, you know, various fields of scientific research or others, if you deal with large numerical data sets, HDF5 is a useful format um, for you. Why would you use HDF5? Well, there are three big picture reasons that I would say, and that would be processing, sharing, and archiving of your data. So for processing, if you're like me, you maybe are interested in a specific data set on a couple of different subjects, and you want to access that data quickly and easily, or you want to hand that off to a collaborator or a colleague quickly and easily. And sometimes this includes different kinds of data that maybe aren't of the same type, and you only want to have part of it. Well, HDF5 supports large, complex, heterogeneous data, and data slicing. So that's um, good for processing. For sharing, many of us want to share our data with collaborators. Um, this becomes, and so, like sharing, sharing is caring. 
Um, <laughs> We want to use something that is pretty easy to use on multiple platforms, um, which HDF5 is, and it's also self-describing, so you don't have to have all of these extra documents on your data. You can just transfer the data file itself, and it's from an open format, which makes that um, good for particularly scientific labs that don't have a lot of funding. Uh, and then for archiving, I don't know about all of you, but I intend to keep my data forever and I would like it to be neatly stored and not stored kind of like a pack rat haphazardly. Uh, HDF5 allows you to do this. It has good compression. It's self-describing again. Um, and also, you might want to use HDF5 because you can do it with Python, and that is reason enough. All right, the structure of HDF5. There's basically three things to think about. Groups, data sets, and attributes. Um, so an HDF5 file has two objects, there's groups and data sets. And when you're thinking about groups, you're thinking about them as Python dictionaries, or if you're in sort of a computer mindset, it's basically like folders or directories. And if you're thinking about data sets, they act very similar to NumPy arrays, and um, that would be kind of like a file on, within one of your folders or directories on your computer. And an attribute is then the metadata that can be on a group or um, on a data set, and that would be something like a label on one of the files or directories. So the schematic that is shown there um, is probably the easiest to keep in your head, and it's just showing um, how groups can be within groups and data sets can be within groups. Um, one thing to note is that every HDF5 file has a root directory. So now we're going to jump in to this IPython notebook and show you some of the basic ways to get started using H5Py. And hopefully this all does well, which is not going to, because that's how the world works. So the presentation now works, but now this isn't showing. Sorry, guys, I thought we had it all together. Huh. It's showing that the displays are mirrored, so I'm not really sure. Yeah. Here. So that's uh, the, this um, IPython notebook is in that repository. All right, two, I'm gonna make this slightly smaller. All right, reminder again, in HDF5, we have a couple of things to think about. Data sets, groups, and attributes. Data sets are like NumPy arrays, groups are like dictionaries. Every object, so those objects in an HDF5 file has a name, and they're arranged in POSIX style um, hierarchy with slash separators. It's pretty easy to get going. The only thing that we're gonna rely on here is NumPy, and um, I'll be using H5Py. I do know that you can use HDF5 in Py tables, but that won't be covered today. All right, um, for installs, it's relatively simple. You can go to the H5 um, documentation in order to figure out how to do that for your particular install preference, but you can, if you're using Anaconda, you can just do conda install h5py. Right here, I'm just going to create a couple of um, NumPy arrays, just for later use. These are, of course, very, very small arrays. Typically, you would use HDF5 with large numerical data sets, but um, learning and visualizing how the hierarchy works with HDF5 is not so easy when you're looking and visualizing large data sets. All right. It's Pretty easy to get a file going. This, um, we're just gonna create a file handle, give this file a name, data, um, and then HDF5 files work just like standard um, Python file objects, and so they have all of the standard modes. This is just going to open up an empty um, HDF5 file for us. And then I will, from there, start going through getting data sets, groups, and attributes into here. The goal with this today would be, if you haven't used HDF5, you could take this notebook, go home, and put all of your data in HDF5 files. All right, um, 
So from the file handle, you can see that there's a lot of different um, methods that we have on the file object. And so one of the ones that we're going to use a lot is create data set. Um, and there'll be other file objects that um, will be useful later on. So to create a data set on our file, um, we can just give it a data set name, call it data. Uh, we'll assign the small array here. And then there's other uh, keywords that you can use within this function call in that something like data type or shape or the compression algorithms. But I won't go into those at this detail here. So just like a uh, NumPy array, you will have this data set is going to have a space and a type and a name. And the other thing that it will have that's you know, um, particular to HDF5 would be it will be belonging to a particular group. In this case, it's belonging to the root group. Alternatively, this is another way that you can assign a particular, uh, um, create a data set in your HDF5 file. So I'm just going to execute that. Again, same thing. But now you'll notice that in my parent group, sorry, in my parent group here, it was one member before, and now I know that there are two members in my parent group. So another useful command line utility is h5 dump that um, can be will help you visualize how you're structuring your data. So this is going to show exactly what we just created. So from the group, um, the root group, we created a data set called data, and we assigned it the the small array, um, and then we also created another data set called small data and assigned a smaller array there. So that's pretty much how it. it um, it works to get a data set set up. Uh, another thing that is useful, as I described before, that you can do in HDF5 um, with the data sets is the data slicing. So just like you would use in, um, for NumPy. In this example here, I will have a short array that's just an integer array. And then just like in the slicing, I'm going to replace some of my data. And this works really well, um, particularly for those of us who are dealing in the scientific community where we maybe want to change some data, add on some data, modify data in any form um, using syntax that we're already very familiar with. All right, the next thing that we'll go on is on groups. So groups, again, are like Python dictionaries. They all have names, the key values, keys, and then the values would be um, either another group or uh, a data set. So again, as I've mentioned before, when we create the file object, it is our root group. Um, but I can also then label my root group or create groups on top of that, which is typically what you're going to do. So here, we're just going to create a group, um, and we're going to call it group one. Pretty simple. And then group ob groups have um, methods just like the file objects do. And so from the group, you can create a group within that group, obviously subgroup here. Or we can create um, groups implicitly. So off the file um, object, I can use create group instead of create data set. And I can list an entire um, the path that I want to the group of interest instead of making all of these groups independently. Uh, now that I've created a couple of different groups on my um, HDF5 file, maybe I'm trying to remember what groups I have on my root directory. And so the two groups I have are group one and group two. Um, then if I want to look into group one and see what kinds of, um, what else I have underneath that directory, then I have a subgroup. Um, you can also create a data set within a group that makes it um, instead of just like you would um, on the function handle or the file handle. Uh, so here we're going to create a data set, give it a name, small, and assign some data. Now I know that this is my path to the data. It would just be group on my function, or on my file. It would be group one to small. Um, there's other ways to create data sets in group. These are just a couple of different examples of how um, you can create a data set. So for like this first example here is something that we would do often as you're building up your arrays or you're going through your analysis and then you're going to assign whatever data you create into your file, you can then come up with you know, the path name that you have or the path to the groups into the data set that you're interested in and then assign your data. All right, so then now we've created a bunch of different groups and data sets within the same file. And it's kind of hard to visualize and think about where that is. So let's see where we've come. And H, again, H5 dump is probably the easiest way to think about what you've got in, in your structure. So from the home group, um, or the root group, I should say, we've created two separate groups on top of that, group one and group two. Within group one, 
Um, we have our small data set. Again, we see the data type and the data space, and then a list of our data. And we also have a subgroup within group one. Um, from group two, we've created a data set that's just in group two, but we've also created a subgroup and then um, another couple of data sets within those subgroups. Instead of looking, let's say, at the H5 dump and you want to see whether or not a particular group or data set is indeed in your file, you can do, it has containership testing. And so in this case, yes, indeed, group two is um, on my root directory or my root um, group. And then again, you can use full path names for containership testing as well. All right, the next thing is attributes. And attributes are basically what makes HDF5 probably, um, it makes it the self-describing format, but it also makes it the most useful because instead of having all of these extra um, documentation on my files or on my data sets, I can assign attributes to the data set or to the group. So these are just small bits of information. There's a few um, following properties, but you, you basically it would be something um, like this first example here where I've got my small um, data set in, in my file and I need to, let's say that it has a sampling rate and so I can assign this little attribute um, to that data set in particular and then I can assign it a task type. So then once I've added in um, those attributes, I can see on my data set what kinds of attributes I have it's pretty basic. Um, we've got the sampling rate and the task type are in there and what kinds of values do I have? Um, this, this item method will, on the attributes, will let me know what methods I assign. You can also label the dimensions of a data set, which I think is um, one, of the, one of the more useful features as well. In, in Particularly in science, we have a lot of times we're transposing different matrices and knowing which dimensions uh, correspond to which pieces of information is useful. So that's um, an easy way to add those, those labels in there. So now we can see, again, after the H5 dump, what we've accomplished, and that is, um, so that'll be down here. So on my small array that I've created under my group, I now have dimension labels that are right in there, and then I also have um, my attributes, so my uh, sampling rate and my task type. So what else can you do with HDF5? Um, after you've created the groups and data sets and you've, you've made your files, that's, that's, you don't even have to go any further than there. That's pretty basic. It will keep your data organized, compressed, and accessible. But you can also do some advanced things, which I won't cover in a lot of detail, but I will briefly mention them here. So chunking is one of them. So typically, if you have a data set that's going to be laid out on disk in traditional C order, but you can also use chunking as you're creating the data set so that it would be divided up and stored um, in a different way. This helps with many things in terms of speed and efficiency that I will not cover here. Uh, but it's a pretty easy syntax in terms of what you're trying to say to your data set. So if I'm creating a data set, just calling that data set here chunked, and then uh, this is just creating a random data set here, and all I have to do is assign the different chunks. So in this case, um, the data would be read and written in these blocks um, with 100 by 100 shape. Now, if you are like me, I don't know how to decide on my chunk shape and don't. Um, so then in, you can use H5Pi to let it decide what kind of chunk shape um, you would like. And so you just can do chunks equals true, and then that saves you some time trying to figure out what size will work best for your data. You can also use different compression algorithms within any HDF5 file. Compression is inherent to that, but you can decide on a different compression algorithm should you want to. Um, there's several that are available, and of course you can create your own compression algorithm if you wanted. You can also do parallel HDF5. This is going to be using the MPI for Python um, package, in which if you've used MPI, it's pretty easy to get started with that. Um, it requires a little bit more um, setup in terms of getting started and getting that um, compiled properly with the correct libraries, but it's definitely well worth it and not that difficult to get going. If you want other um, Python examples, they're on the HDF group. Um, they have several Python examples along with many other different code type examples. All right, now we're going to pretend like we're going to get back. And it works. All right. Okay, 
So now we, um, that's just some basic ways about how you can get started writing up um, some code to get your data within an HDF5 file. There's also some viewers that the HDF group has made. One of them is called HDF View and the other is called HDF Compass. And um, both of them are really useful because you can, it's kind of like the, H, um, the H5 dump that was the command line utility I was looking at, but in this case, you can actually go in and plot some of your data and, and interact with it uh, in a way that's useful. And they are, to my knowledge, expanding on those two viewers to make it um, better for um, scientific analysis of large scale data. So one of the ways that I was going to try to explain um, some of the, uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to describe what we had for our subjects. So um, this is a small schema of how we structure one subject in our pre-processing scheme. I would have liked to have shown you more, but it's, it's not so easy to visualize a large data set. So this is something that we have done for our pre-processing scheme. Um, if we have a subject that's gone through the MEG and we have in that session, they will um, undergo a bunch of different scan types. And so for us, it's always eyes open for a minute and then they do eyes closed for three minutes and eyes open for a minute again. Plus we have comments from the scan technicians that are on that data. And so the scan, um, the info here would be the scan technicians um, documentation in terms of was there a sensor out, did the subject sneeze, was there movement, things of that nature that it's not really structured but it's still good information to have along with the raw data. And then we have all of our, we have a time series group because within the time series group we have information about what kinds of data um, is in there including the headers of those and things like what was the sampling rate um, and other bits of information about how some of the pre-processing was done you know, from the machine itself into the raw data getting passed off to the data analysis people. Uh, so then again, there's multiple scans in there. Most of our people were scanned in those particular ways, but uh, there's other things like we might have experimental designs where they're going and, and doing you know, several different uh, visualizing or playing games or things like that. And that gives us um, a lot of, so this is one part of our HDF5 file would be all of the raw data. Then within that same HDF5 file, we can have our residuals, so we do time series analysis clearly and we want to store the information that we get on the pre-processing there. So we have all of our scan types and groups again, because within each scan type, we would have things like the time series data, the time that it takes to process per channel. We would have things like um, white noise residuals and how that test has prevailed and um, it's given us values in for passing and failing of the test. So this allows us to take all of that bits of information and then go into, if we have this information, now I can go down to the correlations, which is our other group, again, the scan types, and then our different um, analysis techniques down here, along with some attributes. So this, was, this is a structure that we've used um, for our, sub so this would be one subject, and we might have, um, this would be one subject, one acquisition, and a lot of times we have you know, thousands of subjects that come in and get scanned on multiple instances. So this gives us a way to be able to organize and access our data easier. I'd also point out that our ability to structure files in this HDF format, HDF5 format, is if you're not working with people that know how to code or read data, they can easily follow the, you know, directory, the path syntax, and read these files straight off the disk instead of trying to create some other intermediary, intermediate um, type data set that you can hand off. So a lot of times if you have something in a database, people would have to either write SQL queries, well, how do they get that data out of there? So this way you can have um, simple ways for people just to read the data right off disk. Um, so for, uh, in the sciences and, and probably many other places, this um, is, is a definitely good format for us. I'd also say that even if you don't have super large um, data sets, I really like the HDF5 format because I can keep all of my processing within one file. So if you're like me and you go and you wanna do one model and then you wanna try a different model and then you wanna try a different model and you wanna try all these stats and you're doing it on all these different subjects, instead of having all of these different files around, I have one file that I can structure in a way that gives me all the information that I need. 
All right, um, and lastly, I'll just go over some take home messages. So again, HDF5 is a file system within a file. So groups act like folders, um, data sets act like files, and attributes act like labels on the folders or files. If you want to do processing, we want to work smarter, not harder. As Eileen said in the previous talk, humans are lazy. I think that this is a good file format for lazy people. Um, it can help make all of your data accessible, um, and it does support large, uh, complex, heterogeneous data and data slicing. And then, of course, the sharing is caring. We want to work with our collaborators well, and this gives us a, um, a format for the data that is platform independent, self-describing, and of open format. And then, if we want our data to live in perpetuity, HDF5 can help you do that since it's compressed, organized, and self-describing. So last, I will um, give a hat tip to my former BSC colleagues, specifically Shelley Chorn, and then also to Andrew Collette, who's the, leader of, um, the lead author of H5Pi and the HDF group. Without people who do open source, I can't do the science that I need. Um, and I will take any questions. Hi, uh, how fast is appending with this format? Because you can imagine um, that if each series represents, represents a time series and you have multiple groups within a file, you might want to capture all of your data for one day and write it, and then on the next day, append to all of the groups within the file. So it would be, I mean, you don't have to read, you don't have to read in your original time series to append it. So you can just append a, a, on your original file itself. So it would be, you know, just as fast as a, as appending onto, you know, any numpy array. It's not like going through the directories makes it more time consuming. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, what would you say about using uh, HDF five for non numeric like integer and float type things, strings or uh, objects like? date times and that kind of thing. I've had issues in the past. Um, would you recommend it? Is it efficient, that sort of thing? I think that there's probably other structures that would mostly work well. You can, you can use any data type you want within HDF5. But if uh, the main use of HDF5, in my opinion, would be because you have large numerical data. And then on top of that, if you also have some integers and some strings and different things, then you can also add that into the file format. But um, typically, I guess it, it, if you're, I would imagine that there's other data structures that would, that would work out better for other file formats. And the, uh, and the second question is, how do you compare using H5Pi to just the stuff that Pandas has to interact with these file types? Well, to interact with the plot types? I'm sorry, I don't know where you are. Oh, uh, yeah, up here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, because I've, I've done stuff with Pandas and it seems to work fine, but I feel like I'm maybe missing something that this package possibly goes into a bit more depth on. So, it, I mean, it's, it's storing and managing data, so it's not necessarily analysis. And I know Pandas, you can you do time series in there. Um, I, I think it depends, and you could pull from an HDF5 file and put it in a Pandas data frame, and then interact with it that way and go back and forth. Um, this would be, uh, I mean, for like plotting, the, if you're worrying about the plotting, that I would keep separate. Those viewers are, in a work in progress, I think that they can help you look at things, but I don't actually use them at all. Um, so if you're trying to interact with a time series, I would use other other means of interacting with time series or storing them that way. This would be more large scale, you know, storage of your data in a way that is compressed. Hi, how do you share? Um uh, data with your colleagues. Do you have like one big master file? Um, yeah, how do you do that? Yeah. Well, if it, <laughs> it depends on the people, uh, so it no, not in a bad way, but in a because I deal in um, human data, a lot of people don't, a lot of humans don't like me just giving away information about their brain 
wherever. Uh, so typically, we would have in the Brain Science Center where I was before, we have a local storage server there, and we can just give people access through a couple of different servers, and they can just read it directly from there. And using the HDF5 structure, um, we would have a couple of different wrappers so that researchers could read directly from those files. So I would just give them, they would tell me what they want. Um, I would query, get a list file that just gives the path to what they're looking for. So for example, if they say, I want you know, all of the PTSD subjects, you know, their first acquisition, and I want their correlations at you know, 50 legs. I can create a list file that gives me all of that very quickly because everything would be structured the same for all of the subjects. And so I can just, it, it's basically, you know, writing a SQL query, but in a way that makes it a lot easier for me to hand off a list file for them to just read directly from disk instead of creating copies of your data over and over again. Or if you have people that, you know, you don't want text files of all of this data floating around, especially in science. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of times people don't have this kind of memory on their local systems that they're working with. So that's how we would do it. Um, you can also, that's, I mean, that's my experience with sharing data. Yes, you mentioned compression. I, I, I get the sense that what we have here is on this compression. What about compression in memory? Because I have often have data sets that are kind of too big to store, store in memory, yet what I am doing on them may not be, be particularly so complex. So for example, you're doing some row by row kind, kind of transformation and you'd want to store the rows that you're not uh, processing at the moment in a compressed form in memory. So I don't know about compression and memory, but um, I do know that if you are just trying to work with small bits of the data, you can do that. So you can, you just like a NumPy array, you can interact with, you know, if you only want to interact with some rows or some columns, you can do that. So one of the things that we have is some of our sensors fail or some of them don't pass the modeling. So when we get to did you pass or didn't you pass, I can go read in that one didn't pass and I can go fill in the values of you know, that sensor that didn't pass and only deal with that, not read in the whole data set. But in terms of compression about that, uh, it might be there, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, are you aware of the blog post called Moving Away from HDFL? <laughs> Which <No>. came. <laughs> it's uh, somewhat famous and came uh, out uh, at, at the January away from this, it? Year, this year. But it's a from somewhat famous blog post with some, um, maybe some relevant criticisms of, of uh, well, standardizing on this format. Are you aware of the, the criticism? I am not aware of the criticism. I don't know of a better file format for the kinds of data that I deal with. If there is one, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Um, in a lot of the brain imaging that we do, it's, it's hard for us to find. I mean, I also deal with a lot of DICOM images, and there's not a good file format for that as well. So I'd be happy to learn more about it. Um, yeah, there, there are a, a number of points, but um I think it, it pays for people who are not really familiar with uh, usage. There are some pros and also some drawbacks. So there is some risk of, of data corruption actually in storing when, for example, your processes crashes during the write. So in that sense, it's less robust than the real uh, database system. Uh, the, spec, the specs are very complex, so there's only really a handful of people who understand this, it, and there's only basically one implementation around. And the on-disk format is actually not really frozen, so it might be subject to change. So somewhere maybe 10 or 5 or 20 years in the future, we may, might have to dig up a really old version to read it in your uh, old version uh, HDF5. Th those are some of the criticism. Um, I'm not saying I, I agree with all of them, but it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it's useful to be aware of them, I think. Yes, there's definite drawbacks of using HDF5, like many other file formats, but at least to be organized, if not corrupt. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, I just had a, a comment, I guess going to uh, your comment, 
So I'm a, a physicist, and uh, we have these things called root files, which uh, they're quite terrible, to be honest. I think that uh, one, so it's easy to complain about some of the file formats that, um, that exist in the sciences <clears throat> and say, oh, why don't you go to a database? And I think that the, there's sort of a bigger reason, which is just that the, I mean, the, you need a certain skill set and infrastructure to be able to do databases well. And also you have a, I mean, you need to have these solutions uh, work for very long periods of time. I think typically much longer than um, the current trend in technologies. So th I think there are criticisms of the ways the sciences deal with uh, data storage, but I think that it's a little bit more difficult of a problem than, uh, than you're indicating. Other questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Margaret again. Thank you.